Hey guys, Greg here on the Vinyl Rundown. Today I may show you the world's rarest record. This is part of a contest for Jimmy the Saint, also known as Daz. And this is a very late contest entry, but there's a question on here that I thought was so interesting, I wanted to jump in and give you my two cents worth. Uh, Jimmy is kind of a new channel, I think he just hit 100 subs. I think he might be in Scotland from the accent Scotland. And uh, I was in Ireland recently. I, my friend went to Scotland, I didn't go, so I missed the fact that I didn't get there. And uh, anyway, that has nothing to do with anything. Um, I'm going to take these questions out of order because I want to save the best for last. So let's see, the, f the first last question was, what was the most recent record you got? Sorry, the most recent record. And I just got this in the mail last week. Dangerous Liaisons, it's actually the French movie soundtrack. Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers with Barry Willen on uh, saxophone. And uh, this is kind of a hard bop record. It's not really a uh, soundtracky sort of record. It's more of a standard Art Blakey hard bop record. And it says on the back here that Dan Dangerous Liaisons is the most controversial and the most successful picture ever made in French, at the time anyway. Um, don't love the cover, and this was released under a couple different covers depending uh, where it was sold. This is on Epic Records, but uh, you know, 10 or 12 bucks on eBay, not bad. Let's set that aside here. What was the next question? It was the first question before I went out of order. The oldest record in your collection. Well, I went to Discogs and I sorted by year, release date, and I came up with 1950. The early, early days of vinyl records, when everything was still in mono. No reason to say mono or stereo. It just was mono. And uh, vinyl records came out, you could say 48, 49, but for all intents and purposes, 1950 is the beginning. This is Pablo Casals, greatest uh, cello player of his time, and he's directing uh, a music festival doing some box stuff on Columbia Records. And this is all six of your uh, eyes, six eyes, Columbia, and uh, Pablo Casals was very much associated with Bach. One of the most, uh, get in there, it's not going in, one of the most famous classical records of all time was him doing the Bach uh, cello sonatas. Okay, let's move on to question two which is the reason I'm doing this contest, because I thought it was a really cool question. If you could only save one record from your collection, if your house is burning down, what record would it be? And I asked that question out loud, and I thought, you know, it's all a bunch of cheap thrift store scratched up crap. What do I care? <laughs> My son said, Dad, you're forgetting the one record you must save, the one thing you must save, might in fact be the world's rarest record and you've never heard of it, but I'm going to show it to you anyway. Let's see if we can focus in on this. It says Don Martin Recording, that's the name of the studio, uh, and it was recorded at the School of Radio Arts at the Crossroads of the World, which is a famous studio right here in uh, Hollywood by Sunset. You may have seen the Crossroads of the World featured in the Muppet movie as the studio backdrop, old-time, now rundown looking studio. Really cool building, though. But typed in, it says 1 o'clock jump by Joe Darby, Joe Darby Orchestra. And I guess it was uh, broadcast on KFAC Radio at 2.30 p.m., sometime in 1939. And there's actually a couple records, part of this recording session, so all these records together. There's actually three discs, but uh, only four or five usable sides. One of the sides is uh, damaged. Uh, together, I'm going to call this the one record that I would and must save if my house is burning down. And rarest record in the world because the entire output of Joe Darby Orchestra is right here in my hands. And there's only one copy of these. They were, these were not pressed into LPs or 78s. These are an old-timey thing that you might not have ever seen called an acetate. An acetate is like something used for a demo. So... These are actually aluminum discs with a thin coating of plastic or acetate on top of it. Uh, scratched in, 
not not pressed in. So it's a one a one off record. And they're used like as demos and stuff. This one has the name of the tune scratched into the dead wax. You can probably not see that. It says my desire across the top there in big letters. So um why do I care about this record? It's so obscure. No one's ever heard of Joe Darby. Why is this the one record you would save, Greg? Well, Joseph Darby is my wife's grandfather, and he was a semi-successful, hard-working band leader in the 30s and 40s in Hollywood. He lived in the Hollywood Hills. He had eight children. One of those is my wife's parent. My wife's parent, right. Um, we, don't, we know very little about Joseph Darby's musical career, except for these records. I have them transferred onto digital, so I'll play you a track in a bit. Um, let's see, there's a little bit of information here. Hold on. A few things to show you, not much. One of the records, one of the other records in this set had a label. It says Miller Brothers, that's a recording studio. The tune is called My Prayer, which is a famous big band standard. December 5th, 1939. Joe Darby and his Symphonic Swing Orchestra. Piano was his primary in, uh, instrument. And I do have a picture of him doing something pretty awesome. That's, that's Joseph Darby right there. The Coconut Grove Hotel, very famous club, located inside the Ambassador Hotel. Coconut Grove Club inside the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. The Ambassador Hotel is where RFK was assassinated, and they since tore that club down, but that's pretty cool. Hang out in a 50s club. That was in 1953, we think. Um, what else do I need to tell you about Joseph Darby before I play you a clip? And before I, sorry, send you, um, give you the story, the story that goes with it. Just want to make sure I got everything here. Yeah, only two of these discs have um, labels. One weird thing about acetates, um, they could start inside or outside. So marked on the label, you usually say whether you're starting the track on the inside or the outside. I didn't know that at first. I kept putting the needle on the outer edge, and it got pushed off. Well, that's the end. you got to start at the beginning. So I think these are in to out on one side and out to in on the other side. And did I mention acetates are very uh, soft? They're not meant to be played over and over and over. So... Uh, the thing to do is to transfer it over to digital. So I'll play you that in a second. But the last question uh, from Jimmy the Saint is um, a story. So I'll give you a story. There's a lot of stories surrounding a guy working in Hollywood in the 30s and 40s. But one that I just recently learned. Uh, let's see here. Joseph had eight children. And uh, I forget the mix. Is it five? boys and three girls. I think it's five boys and three girls. And uh, his girls had interesting names. I'm not going to give you their exact names, but it was something like Bobby Joe, Betty Joe, Billy Joe, Sally Joe, Peggy Joe. Some of those names. So Mr. Darby was hanging out with one of his buddies who was a TV producer. And this would probably be in the early 60s, maybe late 50s. And that TV producer was putting together a... Um, sitcom, sort of a country western based sitcom that actually went into production called uh, The Petticoat Junction. Uh, takes place in some sort of train stop, you know, on the middle of, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> kind of a country bumpkin sort of a theme, similar to Green Acres. But anyway, the producer was intrigued by Joe Darby's daughter's names, Sally Joe, Peggy Joe, Baby, Peggy Joe, Bobby Joe, and he said, can I use that in my TV show? So literally, if you've seen the show, those are the names of two of the three daughters, or three of the three, I don't know. And one of those young ladies, still alive today, and is the one who gave me all these records. And somewhere in this pile, there's a handwritten note from one of those sisters, along with the records that she gave me. It's on the vinyl rundown. I'm the record guy. I'm the one who should have possession of these in the family. I actually took all these records on 78 to a family gathering a few years ago. Uh, I'll turn on the record and then I'll tell you the story.
let's see if that plays the record. Okay, yeah, that's the digitized version of one of the tunes coming off my uh, computer there. After I got these records, I went and had them digitally archived by a professional here in Los Angeles. But I also have a, I do have a big portable 78 RPM player, tube powered, from the 40s or 50s, I don't know. Anyway, I took that to a family gathering a few years ago. It was a holiday thing. 20 relatives, all descendants of this guy. And the young kids didn't even know that their great-grandfather was a musician and had never seen a 78 RPM record. So I got to play all these records for them. And that was just that was just great, seeing them sit around and listen to uh, this old-timey music. So, a little treasure from the family past. The world's rarest record right here on the Vinyl Rundown. Congratulations to Jimmy the Saint for hitting 100 subs. And we'll listen to just a few seconds of uh, direct-to-disc recording. No edits, no overdubs, no equalization. Live. 1939, my oldest record, my rarest record, the record I would save, and a record with a great story. Hope you don't mind me doubling up on my questions there, Jimmy. Alright guys, thanks again for listening.